Good morning and welcome to the National Museum of Computing. I'm Andrew Herbert, the Chairman of Trustees for the Museum. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today for um, this opening of the Raspberry Pi exhibit celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm sure there are many enthusiasts in the room here who, like me, have various generations of Raspberry Pis and Picos at home. Um, I've sort of slightly lost count, actually. And there's an even bigger pile of ones I've managed to blow up, but there you go. So um, looking forward to the day, we, we start with um, interviews with um, Eben and, and um, talking about the, the, the way the company has grown. I thought I'd offer a personal perspective on it, um, which is almost a slightly embarrassing one. So back in about 2005 or six, um, a group of academics that I worked with, I was with Microsoft Research at the time, were complaining about the students who were turning up to do computer science at university with a computer science A-level that was absolutely useless. And indeed, certain universities, including the one in Cambridge, actually regarded it as negative A-level. If you had it, it was a reason for rejecting you as a candidate because <laughs> um, you knew the wrong thing. And um, these academics wanted something done about it. And if you're running a research lab, you feed off the research students those academics produce. And so it was a problem for us in industry too. So we, we had a meeting um, and out of that meeting came a number of things. An initiative called Computing at Schools, which still goes on, um, which the British Computer Society took charge of. And we started building networks of teachers and we started a campaign to change the curriculum. Also in that meeting was a Cambridge entrepreneur, a guy called Jack Lang. And Jack said, what we need is a new BBC micro. And to my slight embarrassment, I kind of said, well, we're not sure about that. What we need to do is fix the curriculum. But fortunately, as always, Jack didn't listen to me. And while I and others went off and fixed the curriculum side of things, um, he went down the path that led to the, uh, the creation of Raspberry Pi. And it's been a fantastic success. So I look forward to hearing about how that story actually came about, despite my best efforts, um, and look forward to seeing the exhibit. I'd like to thank the Raspberry Pi Foundation for putting on the exhibition, for sponsoring it, and for a whole raft of other activities they're going to be doing in partnership with us throughout the rest of the year. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to PJ, who's going to run the uh, rest of the morning, and we'll shuffle the microphones as we do so. Thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome you all here to the National Museum of Computing. Thank you all for coming. And also everyone uh, watching on YouTube, hi. Uh, without any further ado, we've got two very special guests. Can I please uh, welcome Eben Upton and Philip Colligan. Please make them feel welcome. Hello. 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 So, as I'm sure you know, Evan is CEO of Raspberry Pi Limited and Philip is CEO of, of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So, gentlemen, let's start right at the beginning. What is a Raspberry Pi? Oh. Shall I do it? Because yeah, I, I say the words very frequently. Um, so, a Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer <laughs> that we developed in Cambridge in order to teach young people to program computers. And you can see some fraction of a Raspberry Pi here on the, uh, on, on, on the screen. Uh, I think probably enough, if you fit all the bits together, you probably get a full, a full Raspberry <laughs> Pi. Um, and we've been, we've been making these things for about a decade, um, uh, um, and they've gone through various iterations, but they all basically end up looking like a little green credit card. You plug into your television, plug a mouse and a keyboard into it, and you have a computer. And we started to touch on the genesis of the project there. So where did you pick, get, come into the story? Um, I, well, I've been trying to build little. So I was a, I was a director of studies in computer science at St John's College. So I was directly exposed to some of these challenges with the, um, the num more the number I think than the quality um, of young people. We did, the um, applicant numbers had declined very very rapidly from the end of the 1990s down to about 2005. I think the Nadir was about 2008, which was the year that we incorporated. Um, the foundation. So I'd been exposed to that. I'd been building little computer things for a little while um, uh, uh, before that. Um, and these kind of two strands came together 
Um, and this various people who'd been experiencing the, 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 the decline from various angles, most of them in Cambridge, uh, with the exception of this gentleman at the back here, Pete, um, who's up in the northwest. Um, uh, various of us had been experiencing this problem from different angles, and really Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi Foundation that kind of came together in 2008 was the, 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 the machine, the engine, that was supposed to make this piece of hardware, this, miss, this idea of a missing piece of hardware, the idea that as hardware had gone away, as programmable hardware had left children's lives, um, uh, the number of people interested in computing had declined, very much the idea that if we brought back a piece of hardware, perhaps some of that enthusiasm that we'd experienced in the 1980s might come back, and Raspberry Pi Foundation was the machine to try and build the machine. Fantastic. And the name. Why is it called a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> Um, that's John Crowcroft's fault. So John was a, uh, is a professor at the um, uh, uh, university in, in Cambridge um, uh, and the older of the two universities in Cambridge. Um, and um, it, it, as part of this discussion that Jack um, was, was co coordinating at the, uh, um, at the computer laboratory, um, he sent an email that just said, call it Raspberry, question mark. Um, the idea of fruit named computer companies, there are lots of them. Uh, there's Tangerine, obviously, yes. uh, Apricot. Um, Acorn, I think, technically. Um, uh, there's a big, there's a big well. one in California somewhere. Um, so, you, so there aren't actually that many fruits left. Um, uh, there was, there was, a, there was definitely, there was a strand of. I remember that there'd been some discussion of MIT building an Apple II clone for this purpose. Um, and so this is sort of this kind of slightly kind of pa patriotic, nationalistic thing. Well, if they can do it, we should do it. And Raspberry was slightly intended to be a. <laughs> um, uh, I think that was John's thinking. Anyway, so Raspberry is that, and then Pi is Pi. Pi is the Pi. And pi is Python, um, misspelled because we thought the Pi logo, the the Pi, the letter Pi, would make a fantastic um, logo. Uh, and then we've ended up, obviously, as you can see, with a picture of a Raspberry as our logo. But uh, um, uh, we we didn't find that out until long after we'd frozen the name of the uh, of the foundation. Ah. So, over the years, Raspberry Pis have been used for all manner of things from educational purposes to just because you can type of projects. Have there been any that really surprised you, anything that really stands out, an incredible use of your computer that you never saw coming? You must, you must have, you must have one. Well, I mean, so lots of the foundation's focus, of course, is on young people, and so sort of they are constantly surprising us with what they do with Raspberry Pi computers. Um, let me pick a couple of examples. So, um, oh, there's a wonderful, we run Coolest Projects every year, which is like a showcase where young people show off amazing things that they built. Um, there was uh, the Mind Controlled Robot, um, which was made by a young woman called Laura, um, which had a sensor that you put on your head, um, and you could train it over just a couple of minutes of sort of um, uh, thinking a thought, like left, forward, back, uh, right, um, and then the robot would uh, respond. And Laura said to me, it worked much better for me because having no hair, the sensors were <laughs> a, good, a good connection with my head. And then, the, well, the other, the other one that's very live at the moment is, um, you know, we have Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station, so we have a program called Astro Pi, and we've just sent new... Um, Raspberry Pis into space with, um, you know, a, 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 a later generation, so more powerful with a Google Coral Accelerator and a whole load of new sensors. We're just um, reviewing the projects that young people have made using those sensors and the high vis camera. Mm -hmm. And that is just mind-blowing, seeing the way that they're using machine learning programs, the, uh, the sensors that we've put up there to explore issues like climate change. And, you know, just remarkable, really. So, yeah, lots, lots of examples of what young people do with them. What's interesting about both those examples, and I think most of the cool examples, is they tend to be physical computing yeah. examples. Um, my idea of what people would do with Raspberry Pi was very software oriented because I'm a software engineer and I thought people would write computer games on them because that's what I did with my BBC Micro and my Amiga when I was a kid. Um, and this gentleman talked me into the, the, the chip we use, BCM 2835 in, uh, in Raspberry Pi 1, has a bunch of general purpose IO pins. And um, uh, Pete insisted on, on putting, uh, bringing those out to a header. And I, I, I was very much, my view was very much like, oh, really? You know, people really going to do that? <laughs> what if people short out the pins? Why don't we do that? <laughs> do um, that. But yeah, um, but it's interesting that you know, you, you're, um, one of the great things about general purpose computing, Raspberry Pi is a, is a really staunch advocate of the foundation and the, the training company, are very staunch advocates of general purpose computing as opposed to appliance computing, you know, this. Mm. Uh, 
whatever it is. It's in my pocket, even in my mobile phone. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful computer, but it's, it's an appliance computer. It really only does. Okay, you can, write, you can write software for it, but people only really use it to do things which are within the kind of purview of what its designers imagined that people might do with it. The interesting thing about real general purpose computing, and particularly general purpose computing that has interfacing capabilities that let it talk to the outside world, is that the, 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 the universe of things that people do with it is much larger and kind of extends a long way beyond what we had in mind, what any of us had in mind when we started the project. Amazing. So one of the things that stands out to me is that your project has now become a part of the British computing history. So it's, it's fantastic that oh. the, we have the, the exhibit here, but how does that feel to go right back to Colossus, which is, I can actually see it from over here, um, through the Leo computer, and here we are now. It's quite cool, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite cool. And we sold 46 million Raspberry Pis. It's a lot of, it's kind of to be the, um, uh, I remember when we launched the Raspberry Pi Zero, and you know there's the famous Watson, Tom Watson quote about there being a world market for maybe five computers. And somebody did a, well, they, they, they had the, yeah. the Leo computer being installed, I think it was a Leo yes. computer being installed in Manchester. Yeah. And they held, somebody went and held up, and it was coming off a removal van. And somebody went and held up a Raspberry Pi Zero, which was in exactly the same position <laughs> uh, as, the, as the Leo coming off. And there's people saying, I could see there's a world market for $5 computers. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of fun. So yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I think the other thing I'd add, though, is that, um, the brand, the Raspberry Pi, the iconic image of the, the, the green credit card sized um, uh, PCB, um, stands for something now. And so a lot of our work is in schools all over the world. And it stands for democratizing access to computing and computing education, that price shouldn't be a barrier to you owning a computer. And that you, know, you should be able to play with, make, break, create things with technology, and that everybody should have those opportunities. And I think that's one of the things that I think we can look back on now, 10 years on since the launch, is that not only does do we have an amazing product, 46 million in the wild, but it also stands for something now, and that's what I think the community around Raspberry Pi kind of shares, is that belief that everybody should have the opportunity to hack about with computers. But that word break is a really important one. You mentioned the you mentioned your pile of Raspberry Pis you've broken. Um, we are one of the big things we think we've done with Raspberry Pi is to make a computer so cheap that you can break it. Yeah. Um, the fear of breaking technology, the fear of breaking it, it's back to the, the bicycle versus car yeah. analogy that we used to use a lot early on, which is you wouldn't let a young person in your household probably take the family car apart because it's a complicated thing and easy to break. And once it's broken, your family's lost something that's very important. You might let the young person in your family take their bike apart because it's a simpler thing, less likely to go wrong. And well, you know, if they get it, if they do destroy it utterly, then they just have to walk. Yeah. Um, so, so that idea, particularly with the zero line, but even the the, the big pies of a breakable piece of computer hardware yeah. is really valuable. When my son got um, his first sense hat. And we're like, what are we going to do with it? I'm like, how old are you? Yeah. He's 14 now, so we can work back from there. And what he wanted to do was stick it in the freezer and record the change in temperature. And, you know, you can do that with a Raspberry Pi, right? We stopped short of the next idea, was let's stick it in the oven and see the temperature <laughs> rise. And I was like, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but you wouldn't let him, you wouldn't well, let him put an, an iPad well, in the freezer, been, right? you, All of the components have been in an oven at least once. Right? Twice, actually. There's one for each side on the way. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, put it in the fridge and see whether the light is still on when the fridge door is right. closed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone's interested, by the way, for the people who are here, um, that computer being delivered, the photograph of it is actually just outside on the wall. So do check it out as you walk past. And actually, it was an Elliot 405. Yes. Oh, there we are. Ah. OK. <laughs> Thank you for going easy on me there. <laughs> One of the things I wasn't expecting, and I was one of those that was right there on the day, frantically refreshing the website, trying to get in towards my first one, I'm sure some people in this room were too. The day when nobody could order resistors. In the yeah, <laughs> that's the one. That um, one of the things I wasn't expecting at that point was the community that built up around it, yeah. um, especially sort of people like myself with a few grey hairs who used to love playing around with the user ports on a BBC Micro, mm. suddenly having the option to do that again. Uh, were you expecting that level of community to, to explode the way it did? Well, the community was really surprising. Um, it's a shame Liz isn't here today. Liz, um, my, my wife and our Director of Communications, um, is, is um, about 10 miles away with her, with her parents and, and our children. Um, 
Before Raspberry Pi was a hardware company, we were a community of people who were looking forward to getting our hands on a piece of hardware. Um, you know, we announced this in May of 2011 with Rory's crazy blog post. Um, and there was, so there was a best part of a year window between that and, and, and availability of hardware when really it, we were a community of people looking forward to that. We were a community of people looking forward to this thing. And that's something we've tried to take forward. And that's the thing that Liz built. And it's the thing that we've tried to take forward into everything that the trading company does. And of course, it's become a core part of, of the foundation's yeah. mission, the sort of decentralized nature of yeah, what absolutely. you guys do. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, I joined a little bit later. So I was, what, 2015. Um, so by that stage, yeah, the Raspberry been here Pi 12 community. Years now, 12 years now. 12 years, yeah. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi community was already huge, but it's been core to everything the foundation does. You know. The volunteers who are running events, the code clubs, coded dojos, which are powered by um, people who give up their time, and then you know if you think about educators, you know there is an amazing community of teachers, you know, in the UK but all over the world, who are transforming the opportunities that young people have to learn about technology, and uh, it's one of the best parts of my job is hanging out with them, really. Yeah, and it's been one of the painful things about the last couple of years. Oh, yeah. yeah, so one of, the, one of the things that really dramatised to us how, like this sort of event is the lifeblood of the Raspberry Pi project, yeah. and when suddenly something happens that means you can't have these anymore, yeah. you, you feel the loss more than you would have imagined. I mean, and the really good news, the promising news, is they're coming back, right? So, so we're starting to see um, jams, dojos, code clubs coming back now. We yeah. held a... Uh, we hold Coded Dojos at the Foundation Office in Cambridge and oversubscribed for the session a couple of weeks ago, got some youth volunteers and what's lovely is some of the kids who were in the dojo a few years ago are coming back now as mentors. Um, so yeah, so the demand's still there, but yeah, what a horrible two years it's been, we've really missed yeah. it. When I was a kid, I used to, um, every other Friday, and I used to hate the Fridays that weren't those Fridays, 7.30 till 9.30, I used to go to a computer club in my hometown in Ilkley. Um, and a, a family friend of ours, Alan Drew, used to pick me up. I used to take my BBC Micro, pack it up in its um, styrofoam box, uh, get my black and white 14 inch television, load them, get them downstairs in the kitchen. Alan would turn up, load them into his car, take it, set it up. And so for two hours every week, I had people, like minded people, to talk to about computers. And I had people who I could, we, I could see what they'd done and I could show them what I'd done. And like audience, I mean, this is where like coolest projects. Is, is such an important part of what we do um, because it gives people an audience. It's all very well making cool things, but how, making cool things and then having somebody look at them, I don't have to say it's amazing, just look at them, is really, really, really valuable motivator. And so you know, one of the things that the events like this and events like the ones the foundation recreate, you know, we talk about recreating, there are reasons why the 1980s is not a perfect thing to try to rebuild, particularly the gender balance yeah. mm. in, in, the in the participation in computing in the 1980s wasn't ideal. But there are some really important aspects of that era that are worth recreating. And I find you know, the clubs, of, particularly Dojo, which is more the more kind of anarchic, yeah. um, decentralized of the two networks, is very recognizable to me from my childhood and sort of replicates a thing which was really important in my getting involved in computing and staying connected to computing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, over the years, from I guess probably from 13 to 18. Yeah. So let's move on to the education side of things, mm -hmm. Philip. Um, we've just been talking about uh, Coda Dojo, um, and the, there are many different projects mm -hmm. that Raspberry Foundation are involved in. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah, so I mean, we basically do three types of things, right? So we help schools um, introduce computing, computer science, and uh, related subjects. So that's curricula, teacher training. Um, uh, platforms which are used by students and, and teachers and we do that um, all over the world. We, got, we run the National Centre for Computing Education with some partners here in the UK which is training um, teachers in every school and I think at last count something like a quarter of a million teachers have taken one of our online courses now. Um, so, and all of that we're able to do at no cost to schools or teachers which is you know, amazing. Uh, so that's a big chunk of our work. And you know, changing what happens in schools long term is the most critical thing we can do, but it's not the only thing. Kids learn lots outside of schools, as we know. And so the second chunk of work is all about learning outside of schools, and that's online, it's in clubs, it's in youth and community organisations. 
it's you know activities that aren't part of the curriculum like our space program so that's all about inspiring giving opportunities can we say like kids. our space program again yeah no, no. <laughs> 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 that many there's not many charity chief execs who stress about the weather at launch sites for rockets you know <laughs> um, but i did i did have a moment there um and you know it's important to say our work is global, right? So you know in India we're working with Pratham Education Foundation, who work in rural villages all over India with kids who will never meet a qualified teacher in their lives, right? And we are partnering with them using um, uh, uh, Raspberry Pi devices, but also giving them access to computing education. So those kids are in code clubs, and um, where they're building animations and games with technology, right? It's just amazing. So, um, so it's schools, things that happen outside of schools, and then research. So a big part of what the foundation's trying to do is some rigorous research around how do you help young people learn these skills, and how do you try to address things like the gender imbalance. Um, and so we last year launched the Raspberry Pi Computing Education Research Centre at the University of Cambridge, which is a nice kind of circular thing. It's a partnership with the Computer Lab. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what the foundation does. And we, we do it, as I say, all over the world now. And how would you say the Raspberry Pi computer itself facilitates that? Oh, well, uh, lots of ways. Um, so, I mean, as I said, the brand stands for something, um, which is incredible. Um, the profits from the sale of Raspberry Pi computers is kind of helpful. So We've returned the occasional. <laughs> yeah, well, it's over, over <laughs> 30 something million pounds now. And we combine that with um, you know, funding from uh, donations, philanthropists, and, and from governments. But then the, the, the products themselves are, are essential, I think, in two ways. So one is, um, as we've talked about, Raspberry Pis being used in um, physical computing projects. And that's not just the, you know, the, the, the main board. I mean, the Pico is obviously huge now. Things like the collaboration we have with Lego. Um, you know, we're helping kids bring their ideas to life through um, low-cost uh, computing and electronics projects. But then increasingly, the latest generation of devices that Evan and the team create are just giving access to um, a, a general-purpose PC. You know, the Pi 400 is just transformational in solving the problem of access to computer, whether you're learning to code or whether you're just, you know, taking part in your homework or, 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 or whatever else. So those are the different ways, I think. Um, yeah, it's 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 core to what we do. Just to pick up on a couple of a couple of aspects of that. One, the 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 money from the uh, from Raspberry Pi from the trading business and the way and the way that interacts with philanthropic corporate and individual philanthropic giving has yeah. been interesting for me. Right. That it's it's the the certainty of a stream, you know, the certainty that the organisation will be around in a year's time, or in two years' time, or in three years' time, makes it a much more fundable proposition yeah. for philanthropists, because of course, you know, for, uh, you know, cor particularly corporate philanthropy, you're very worried that you're going to give money to an organisation that's going to dry up and blow away. And one of the most common mitigations for that is that you make short-term awards, so you make one-year awards. Yeah. That's a nightmare for the recipient because um, because you, you can't plan long-term. Yeah. It's very difficult for the donor as well yeah. because the donor ends up expending huge amounts of effort on administering, repeatedly administering grants. If you have an organization that has the stability that comes from a long, with a long-term funding stream from, uh, uh, from, from the trading activity, um, you can you can go out and pitch the idea that look, you know we'll be around in three years' time. You know that we you know we'll be around in three years' time. You know that a lot of our central cost our central cost structure is is covered by uh, by by trading money, um, and so you can make longer term commitments to us safely. You can be confident that the majority of the money you give will go to the project that you're interested in to to project work rather than to, to funding central overhead. Um, so that turns out to be very powerful. That turns out to be a very powerful proposition. We are, I think, the best place for you know, if somebody wants to, uh, to, to to make an impact in our area. We are the very best place to allocate money for that, uh, and that's and that's that's gone very well. Um, the other one is this point about. Um, formal engagement with formal education and how maybe the mission of the foundation has changed over time from having this very anarchic, certainly my view of this is this very anarchic homebrew, home education, home coding world that I grew up in, we've come to appreciate the limits of that and the importance of um, uh, um, 
formal education as an adjunct to that, ensuring that everybody, I mean, remember in the 1980s, none of us, there were, you talk about making the computing curriculum better. Um, there was no computing curriculum. There was no computing teaching in school, effectively, in the 1980s. Um, it was then replaced with a, the, 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 the nothing, <laughs> was, was replaced with a very office application-centric curriculum, which has now been reformed. Um, but the, the absence of formal education means that there will be very large numbers of people, unless they're lucky enough to fall into the hobbyist community world, um, uh, they'll, get, they'll have nothing. And so providing a baseline of quality formal education to everybody is really important, particularly for equality of access. The quality of access across socioeconomic groups, quality of access across gender, quality of access, uh, of, of access across any of these axes. You know, formal education is the thing that underpins that, and it's why it's, I think, such an important part of the work that you guys do. Fantastic. One of the um, items in our new ex exhibit is a robot by a young lady called Avi. Okay. Yeah, uh, she's part of Coda Dojo and Coolest Projects. Uh, so can you talk a bit about the importance of young people doing these projects and showcasing their work? Yeah, uh, actually, Avi's brilliant. I mean, there's so many. One of the best bits of the job, actually, is getting to meet these young people who just do incredible things with technology. and and. So there's a couple of reasons why the showcasing storytelling element of it's important. Um, so one is, and this is to Evan's point about computing clubs and so on, um, getting the positive reinforcement and feedback is super important for them, but they also pull each other along. So what you see with kids who attend Coolest Projects events or Coda Dojos year after year is not only are they very proud and learnt a lot by the thing they've made, they're also looking at what other kids are making and thinking, well, I can do that, and next year I'm going to come back with something more like that. So that's an important part of it. But then also, there's this point about role models. You know, and we need, particularly in terms of things like getting more girls involved or kids from different backgrounds involved, we need to be um, showcasing um, and, and shining a spotlight on kids from all sorts of backgrounds so that everyone feels they can be part of this. You know, one of the challenges, I think the legacies from the, the situation you were describing happening in the 80s and 90s, is that it looks to a lot of young people like you've got to be a certain gender or from a certain, <laughs> from a certain background to be in computing. And it's just not true, right? Um, it's ridiculous. I mean, the computer industry looks like, I mean, it looks like me. Um, and that's not right. It's fine yeah. that people like me are involved in computing, that's wonderful, yeah. mm -hmm. but we, are, we leave so much talent yeah. on the table. You know, from, from the point of view of the industry, it's a disaster for the industry, because you know, we are so, we are starving for talent. I mean, anyone, who, anyone in here who's involved in trying to recruit engineers knows how we are starving for talent. You know, the, you know, the number, the time it takes to fill any role. So the industry is starving for talent, but also individuals are missing out on the opportunity to have this amazing job. Yeah, you know, engineering just has this, this Ah, it just has this, this PR problem that it's just, you know, they pay you money to sit indoors, good money, to sit indoors in the warm, and every day they bring you problems to solve, challenges, Lego, basically just toys, problems to play, <laughs> Lego to play with and problems to solve. And they do that every day and they pay you good money to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, who wouldn't want that job? And, you know, if we, if we somehow create an environment that, 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 that makes some people feel that it's not for them, that's a disaster for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my card later. <laughs> <laughs> in the 70s and the, uh, and the early 80s, they had this, the government had this TOPS programme, which used to churn out reasonably qualified software developers. Mm. Uh, and I think that's certainly yeah. uh, 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 something that's missing, because we can't rely on bringing the offshore yeah. people yeah. on board. Yeah. Year after year. Yes. Decade yeah, we've year. Become a, we, we, we become as a country a little bit a parasite on other countries, uh, you know, we 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 draw people from, uh, you know, particularly my my uh, in, in industry uh, semiconductors. We draw people particularly from India and China. Um, we just we're just a parasite on, on on these other countries that are doing a better job of educating their their, their, their engineers. And it's why it's why the changes that we've seen in the last five to ten years are so powerful. Um, but you know, more government involvement, particularly among, in adult education. Actually, adult education. Tilly Blythe is one of our uh, trustees at the foundation uh, and is a curator at, what, what is her role yeah, now? She's become really staggeringly, she's, yeah, staggeringly yeah, senior yeah. now at the Science Museum. Yeah. She wrote a, a, a study a few years ago of, the, um, of the, um, the computer literacy project that gave rise to the BBC Micro. The really interesting thing there was I had 
having experienced the BBC Micro as a child, my view of the BBC Computer Literacy Project had been very much about its impact on children. Okay. Uh, but what, when you go and look at it, how much of that was focused on reskilling adults and providing adults in sunset industries with an alternative route into, into good employment? It's very important. And that's probably if there's a thing that's missing. A lot of progress has been made in the last 10 years. But if there's a thing that's missing, it's probably that focus on adults and po probably also the focus on industrial strategy that's gave us, you know, if you go to Bristol today, you'll find the place is chock full of semiconductor engineers. Why is it chock full of semiconductor engineers? Because of Inmos, because of the failed UK government investment in building, in trying to build a, a, a national semiconductor industry where the kind of the core mission, build Inmos, failed, but spalled off this enormous mm. supply of very, very talented, very, very qualified IC engineers that's now the anchor of this kind of big, big silicon community. So those are probably, you know, if there are things which are, I guess, out of scope for the foundation, which is very focused on, um, on children, if there are things that could be done that are out of scope, it's probably that constellation of industrial strategy and adult education. Mm. Digression. Sorry. <laughs> things we can't solve. <laughs> things we can't solve, but Not we yet. can at least complain about. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. But ten years ago, we couldn't solve anything, and we just complained about things. Yeah. <laughs> so we're here today to the opening of the exhibition, which we've kindly sponsored, showcasing ten years of Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're open till five o'clock, so there's plenty of time for all of you here to have a look at the exhibit and all the wonderful things we have at the National Museum of Computing. Uh, for the benefit of those on the live stream, uh, we've prepared a short video to give you a little guided tour and sneak preview of the exhibit. Let's take a look. Oh, it going to appear? <laughs> hey everybody, Mr C from the Raspberry Pi Foundation here. We've been working on a brand new exhibit at the National Museum of Computing and I wanted to give you all a sneak peek on what we've been up to, so come along and have a look. This is the new exhibit here in Milton Keynes at Bletchley Park. You can see here on the wall we've got a Raspberry Pi mounted to the wall and you can see the map with our micro SD HDMI port showing you how to put a Raspberry Pi together. And you can see just underneath we've got some Raspberry Pi workstations where you can come in, turn on a Raspberry Pi, sit down, have a play with one, see what it's all about, do some coding, have a bit of fun on a Raspberry Pi. Around here We've got our cartoon and animatic which explains how Evan Upton invented the Raspberry Pi, came up with the idea to help computer science students around the world. All done in this really cool cartoony style for us, really entertaining. Across here we've got a cabinet here filled with old artifacts, old Raspberry Pis. This one here is one of our Alpha machines made in 2011, one of the very first Raspberry Pi designs. Up to the Zero, our tiny little one we were giving away for free. The Pico, even smaller again. And the Pi 400, our flagship unit now, the one that we release for education purposes and young hobbyists all over the world. Speaking of young hobbyists, you can see here we've got all these photos of our community. These are all young people who have come in and been at events that we've run, come and built their knowledge, skills and confidence to use computers all over the globe. And then moving across, we have this interactive table. We have here a Raspberry Shake, which is like a seismometer which detects earthquakes. We have a Piper computer here, which is a really cool self-contained laser cut machine for learners and educators to use. And in our final cabinet here, we've got all these really cool, amazing artifacts, some of the really amazing stuff that Raspberry Pi can do. We've got Avier's Voicetronic robot here, which responds to voice commands. We've got a really cool little hacked together cardboard buggy at the back there. This is our IZ, so this is a Pi-based video synthesizer, really cool thing. Wildlife camera, a sense hat, our new build hat for Lego, and then across here in the corner, the coolest thing in my opinion is the Astro Pi unit that went to space as part of our Astro Pi challenge. So come down to Milton Keynes, everybody. Come to the National Museum of Computing. Have a look at the Raspberry Pi exhibit that we've just put together. It'd be really awesome to see you down here. Catch you later. Fantastic. So let's talk about the future then. I'm hoping that uh, in 10 years' time, we'll all gather uh, here again for 20 years of the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> well, the weird thing is that one of the very, very first events that we did um, for uh, as Raspberry Pi was the 30th anniversary of the BBC Micro, ah. an arm yeah. in, in, in um, the, the um, spring of uh, 2012. Um, there was an event at Armed. And so it's, it's kind of 10 years. It's kind of not, yeah. you know, we've been around, Raspberry Pi has now been around for a quarter of the time that the BBC Micro has been around for. And, you know, that's going to keep, you know, 20 years is going to feel fairly, <coughs> fairly momentous, I think. 
So what, what, uh, what's the aspirations for the next 10 years for the Foundation and for Project Power Limited? What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you going to do? So, I mean, we've got big aspirations. So we think that, you know, every school should offer an amazing computing curriculum for every child, and that's everywhere on the planet, right? And we think, and we, you know, we partner with organisations now in in uh, well, think, Pac-Man fifty, yeah, yeah, quite fifty countries. So we're partnering with organisations in fifty countries to help make that happen. And we also think that every community should have a bit like, think of it like music or sport, right? Every school should offer a music or sport curriculum. But every community should have a vibrant sort of network of sports and music activities that young people can do outside of school as well. So that's the kind of uh, the vision. More near term. Um, the big thing that we're doing in the foundation now is expanding into sub-Saharan Africa. So we're just launching partnerships in Kenya and South Africa. Um, we've done a lot of work over the past few years in India. And that's amazing for us, very humbling uh, experience. We're learning a huge amount about those markets. But, you know, for us, yes, we want to have an impact in the UK and America and, and, uh, uh, and Canada and Australia. But we're also pushing ourselves to have an impact in low middle income countries. So that's probably the big stretch for us in the next period. Mm -hmm. And I guess for us, general purpose computing, right? We want to keep general purpose computing alive. We really, we really believe in general purpose computing as it, it, it's, it's not a thing that we don't have a God given right for general purpose computers to exist. It's almost a historical accident that there are general purpose computers. And obviously, the PC and the Mac, the kind of two big surviving um, members of what, of the, surviving representatives of what was the way that all computers were at, at one point. You know, Raspberry Pi is already, I think, a very important part of the general purpose computing world. We want to make it a more important part. We've always seen ourselves as a PC company, and what you've seen happen over the last, since we launched Raspberry Pi 4 in 2019, you've seen us really deliver a PC-like experience mm. for the, the median computer user. You know, it's always been a usable PC for a subset of users, and the size of that subset has grown, I think, now Raspberry Pi 4. And we discovered this in the pandemic when we yeah. were just deploying Raspberry Pi 4s and then Pi 400s um, uh, to, to young people in the UK who were uh, struggling to access um, uh, um, computing, uh, access the, the internet. Um, we discovered that legitimately 4 and 400 are PCs for the median user. And that will expand, you know, obviously there will at some point in the future be a Raspberry Pi 5, and be a Raspberry Pi 6, a Raspberry <laughs> Pi 10. I, I can't, it'd be interesting to, to see where we are in, Raspberry Pi 4 has proved to be a platform with incredible legs. We've recently mm. posted a performance update from 1.5 to 1.8 gigs. So it's a platform that we are stretching and will continue to try to stretch. I wouldn't like to try and predict how many new Raspberry Pi generations we will have fitted in in another 10 years time. Hopefully a couple, maybe. We might be on Raspberry Pi 6 by then. Um, but really the hope is that, um, just as the Foundation's mission is, that everybody in the world will have had an opportunity, will have an opportunity to experience a world-class computing education. Our mission is to ensure that everybody in the world has an opportunity to own their own general purpose computer. Uh, we think it's transformational. In education, we also think it's transformational in entrepreneurship. You see the number of people who are building their businesses around Raspberry Pi, building their products on top of Raspberry Pi. There's a lot more to do there. Um, Pico and RP2040 open up a really interesting new angle there. You know, this is now Raspberry Silicon. Um, you know, this is, this, this is first, pass, first, first party silicon. It's a device, RP2040, that's come along at a very interesting time when you can't buy anything else. Um, so it's both, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great product, but, you know, one of the lessons, I think, of technology is that a great product is not always enough. Um, uh, you know, you people will, people are in inherently conservative and will stick with inferior um, uh, products if they're the product they know. The really interesting thing about RP2040 is it's come along, it's an amazing product, and it's come along at a time when you can't buy anything else. And therefore, there is a real push for people to discover RP2040 as a platform, build their products around it. We have people now buying RP2040 from us at 100,000 unit scale who are telling us that their alternative would have been to fold their business up. Mm. It would have just to stop, not to shrink, but just to stop because they can't buy anything else. Huh. Um, once they've experienced it, they become very, very excited and enthusiastic and passionate and they, they, they start to advocate, advocate for it. We actually have enough material on hand or in process to build now 25 million more. We've sold several million RP2040s. We have material on hand to build t by August. Um, our wafer output and, work in, and, and WIP will be sufficient to build a further 25 million RP2040s. So we really are 
We really believe in that. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity to both to build interesting new educational products. The um, the Lego product, the Build Hat, um, is built around RP2040. We will have future educational pro pro products that are built around RP2040. So it's an interesting opportunity to build our own product, but it's also as with all Raspberry Pi products, an opportunity to enable other people to do interesting business that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And that's exciting. Very. You know, yeah. semiconductor company in 10 years' time, you know? Yeah, so yeah. for anyone who doesn't know, what you do is, when you wake up in the morning, get the phone out, open up Twitter, and see if he's tweeted morning. <laughs> yes. At that point, yes. I start refreshing yes. pepperoni. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, don't, I don't tweet in the Yes, that's it. <laughs> we went through a bit of a... The interesting thing was we went into the pandemic with quite a queue of products ready to go. And so there was quite a lot of, um, often for a little while, pictures of Kit, my, my then less than one year old son, mm. on the playmat in the morning. And a picture of, yes, a picture of Kit on the playmat at 6.45 in the morning was generally, as you said, a sign <laughs> that you should start refreshing Pimeroni. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not done yet. Excellent. Well, on that point, um, Helen, do we have time for questions? How are we doing? One or two questions. Has anyone got a question? Yes. When you designed the first Raspberry Pi, you so, didn't have an A, you didn't have an A, you didn't incorporate an ABC. Ah, uh, yes. Now that means that um, uh, the plenty of other <laughs> peripheral manufacturers yeah. benefited from that. Yes. Was that a conscious decision? I don't think it was a conscious decision, was it? We just didn't have any money. Yeah. yeah. They, they used to call me the hatchet man because every idea they'd come up with, I'd go, no, cost too much. We left lots of things off, but the principle that we used was if it needed to be there for the educational mission, we would put it on there. Mm -hmm. If you could live without it and perhaps have an add on board to provide it, like the real time clock is a famous one. Mm -hmm. Uh, the power on switch is an even more and a reset. By the 20th anniversary of Raspberry Pi, there will be a Raspberry Pi that has a power switch. Be product announcement. <laughs> Raspberry Pi 4 Plus. It's just the Raspberry Pi 4, but with the power switch. <laughs> but for what is curious, the original manufacturing bomb that was going out to China was not going to have the GPIO header on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by some... I, wasn't, I clearly wasn't paying attention. No, no, you, you clearly, yeah. clearly the drugs had worked and you yeah. left it yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. But that was... Uh, I'm going to tell my bomb story now. Now he's a bomb. I'm going to tell my bomb story. Um, so I remember being on the phone to Pete from the departure lounge at uh, Heathrow on my way to California for, 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 for something in the autumn of 2011 when we were working on really trying to get the thing down to an achievable manufacturing point. And I had a call with Pete and I said something like, could you send me the bomb? Um, because I'm going to be on the plane for 10 hours. I'm going to do a lot of work on the bomb. I want to go through the bomb a few times. I can do a lot of work on the bomb on the plane for 10 hours. And I was kind of aware of this circle of silence expanding <laughs> out and around. Uh, and knowing where the nearest of the gentleman with the, the bulletproof vest and the, uh, the MP5 um, submachine gun was, and thinking, I hope that circle of silence doesn't, it doesn't intersect with the position of one of the, the angry gentlemen. Could have been um, different story. But I survived. So, so that's good. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, so, but that's good news because it means we get to open the exhibition and for you to all have a look at it. Uh, so, just like to say thank you again to Evan and to Philip for joining thank us you. today. Well, thank you. We're really privileged to have you here. And uh, here's to 10 more years of Raspberry Pi. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we all sit here awkwardly. <laughs>